Hello everyone, my name is Ismail Shakhtartinsky. I'm the principal immigration attorney at IS Law Firm. Today is Thursday, August 24th, 2023, 12.30 p.m. Washington DC, New York time. And today we have our weekly live stream on immigration topics. Today's topic is CBP-1 and current state of border processing at the southern border in Mexico for asylum applicants. I will briefly tell you about the news and I will uh, then answer questions from our audience members. Uh, so uh, as you all know, CBP-1, I'm sorry, before we go into that, uh, anyone who joined, thank you so much. Please uh, post any questions you have in the chat section. I will do my best within next one hour to answer as many questions as possible. I see there are lots of questions from our audience members on social media that are already posted there. I will answer those questions. And I see some of the current audience members also posted some questions. Please, any questions you have regarding immigration, post it in the chat section. Uh, I will briefly talk about the CBP-1 process, the current state of play, and also, and then I will go into answering the questions. Also, please like uh, this uh, live stream and please also subscribe to our channel. I greatly appreciate it. All right. so. Um, the CBP-1, as you all know, is an app which can be downloaded in Mexico uh, by asylum applicants who are trying to enter the United States to be processed in orderly manner to be allowed in to enter the United States and apply for asylum. Uh, all of the applicants are placed in the removal proceedings in immigration court upon entry, and they will be given a date to appear in court. Now, I'm not going to go into details of how to use CBP-1 or what to expect after you enter the US, uh, because we have lots of videos that are posted on our channel. And this is another reason why you should subscribe to our channel is to see all of those uh, important videos that we post on our YouTube channel and also on our Facebook page. Um, so, but I will tell you what the current status of CBP-1 is, what is the expected wait time based on the reports from my clients, from our clients, who enter the United States uh, during various periods of time and they apply for asylum, they retain us for the services. And that's how we know about the current processing, as well as through my communications with my fellow colleagues at American Immigration Lawyers Association, where we talk about you know, the current processing times and so on. Um, so currently CBP-1 processing is getting longer and longer, unfortunately. Uh, part of it is because of the number of users. Uh, the second part is that it's being either abused, taken advantage of, or um, it's being sabotaged, maybe, uh, because there is a significant spike in the number of illegal entries. Indiv individuals who enter the United States not using the CBP-1 app, uh, but entering through the border uh, using either smugglers or some, you know, uh, groups, individuals, or crossing the desert or, you know, swimming across the river or jumping off the fence. So over the fence. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, this happens more frequently now. And, and, and part of it is to blame is the CBP-1 app and the wait time. So the Government needs to increase number of officers at the border so that the CBP can process what they plan. Now, the CBP-1 app, this entire process that this Biden administration started, is controversial in itself in that, you know, the Republicans are suing the government because it, you know, they, they are claiming it basically means open borders. It's never been as easy to enter the United States to apply for asylum as now. Uh, but uh, at the same time, the immigrant rights groups sued uh, also the, the administration uh, because uh, the CBP-1 app has all these glitches. So a number of individuals, they come to Mexico in the hopes of being able to use it. First of all, it's not as intuitive, as not user-friendly as it could be. Secondly, some people don't have smartphones, uh, you know, some uh, refugees don't have smartphones to be able to use it. Um, and, you know, even if they register, they have a long waiting time. So from what I hear uh, from my clients uh, who entered fairly recently, you know, it takes 
over five weeks, several months uh, to wait. In the past, it used to be when it started, it used to be about five days, one week, two weeks, but now it takes uh, many weeks. So if you are planning to use CBP-1, or if you know someone who is planning to enter the United States through Mexican border uh, through this orderly process, you know, which is supposed to be orderly, this legal process, um, make sure that they know and they are ready. They should be prepared to remain in Mexico for quite some time. And some of my clients report that it's really dangerous in some parts of Mexico where they remain. You know, some of my clients report changing hotels multiple times, places that they stayed uh, multiple times before they are able to, uh, you know, finally have an appointment and enter the United States. So be prepared for that. But this, the, the, the rest about the CBP-1 process is still the same. Uh, once you enter, there is not much questioning still. Uh, the government does background check. They do verify the identification documents, but there is not much else being asked. There is no credible fear interview. There is not much questioning about your case. Uh, nevertheless, meaning your asylum claim before they let you in. Uh, nevertheless, we strongly recommend to prepare your case, to have your case ready, to have the documentation and to have the proof of either financial ability or support here in the United States, someone in the U.S. who's willing to sponsor to allow you to stay if needed in the U.S. at their residence uh, you know, to have the proof from them, not just the phone number and name, but actually have documentation and maybe a letter, written statement, um, tax returns and so on. That's going to be very helpful. So if you or someone you know is planning to enter the United States through southern border to apply for asylum, make sure they contact us or they contact any other qualified, experienced immigration attorney who can help them prepare for it. It's not an easy process. And what I hear also is that there are more and more detentions at the border. There is a lot of pressure on the Customs and Border Patrol, on the Biden administration, because from the reports, we hear that there have been number of individuals who are on the United States federal watch list, somebody who is on no-fly list, somebody who is not allowed to enter the United States due to national security issues that have tried to enter the U.S. through southern border. And so there are many detentions, more detentions, not as many, um, especially of the young you know, males or, or single males. Sometimes from what I hear is that if a family comes, sometimes male gets detained. But again, it happens much less frequently than any other method of entering the United States to apply for asylum, especially crossing the border illegally. You have to understand, if you cross the border illegally, meaning without inspection, uh, without coming to the checkpoint or using the CBP-1 app, you are risk, well, without using CBP, even if you come to checkpoint, but without CBP-1 app, you are risking losing your asylum claim because you probably move through various countries to arrive in Mexico and Mexico itself, you have to demonstrate that you couldn't apply for asylum. So the presumption of transit ban applies in your case. If you don't know what transit ban is, you can watch our videos on our uh, YouTube channel and Facebook posts about transit ban. It's very important. You can lose your asylum claim you can lose your entire case because you entered the United States without using the CBP-1 app or without a lawful visa through which you entered the United States. So uh, be careful, be prepared to remain in Mexico for quite some time, as I said, you know, for two months or sometimes more. Uh, there is no specific timeline. They try to do as much as they can and they promise to improve or to increase number of the CBP officers to schedule appointments earlier, faster, or to crack down on, you know, uh, misuse of the app. But there is no specifics. There is no guarantee that they will be able to. All right. So with this, I will move on to answering questions. If anyone joined now, thank you very much for joining. My name is Ismail Shakhtarczynsk, and I'm the principal immigration attorney and founder at IS Law Firm. I'm a member of American Immigration Lawyers Association, 
and I have uh, more than 16 years of experience practicing as immigration lawyer here in the United States. Our office is located near Washington, D.C. in Fairfax, Virginia, and we schedule appointments for consultation online. We do video conferencing, video consultations. You have a link on top of the chat section and in the description of this video below where you can click to schedule a consultation with me. Once you click, you will see a calendar where you can choose the date and time for your consultation. The consultation fee we charge is $250, but it gets deducted from future fees. So if you start working with us on your case, this consultation fee gets applied towards your future fees so the consultation becomes free of charge. So I'll move on to answering questions. Please, again, post any questions you have. It doesn't necessarily have to be related to CBP-1 or Southern Border Processing. You can post any questions about immigration matters. And if you know someone, a friend, relative, colleague, acquaintance, somebody who may need immigration help or has immigration questions, you can refer them to this channel and tell them that this immigration attorney who handles all kinds of immigration cases for more than 16 years, answers questions online, live, every Thursday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which is New York and Washington, D.C. time. Again, every Thursday, 12.30 p.m. On some Thursdays, once in a while, we have a delay, or if I have a court hearing, then I have to reschedule it for another date. We do announce it ahead of time. But next week, it's going to be again on Thursday at 12.30, uh, as long as everything stays the same. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and answer all the questions. Please post your questions in the chat section and like this live stream. If you don't like it, please post uh, what you don't like about it. I would be happy to hear about it. Okay, so Terry is asking, I have a fiancé from Cuba who has been waiting at the border for two months now. Does anyone know the average wait time? So there is a process from, for Cubans. I don't have it offhand. Um, but the average wait time, as I said, it can be about two months uh, from what I hear, not as more that much more than that. So, um, you know, be prepared for possibly a long wait time. Uh, there is no guarantee that it's going to be faster than several weeks of wait time. All right. Um, the question from Tia. Uh, hi, sir. I'm an asylee and my family, son and wife in the back home. Can they apply for a visit visa or can my son apply for a student visa to us since their name also in my case in U.S.? Um, Tia, I, I really doubt that they will give your family a visit visa or your son a student visa because they will be presumed as intending immigrants since you're an asylum applicant. Obviously, they're coming to join you, and once they enter the U.S., they can easily join your case and be part of your asylum case, eligible for asylum as derivatives. And the U.S. consulates are prohibited from issuing visitor visa or a student visa, basically most of the non-immigrant visas, to someone who is intending to permanently remain in the U.S., to stay in the U.S. Uh, for any other purpose other than being a student or a visitor. So I doubt they will issue, but what you can do is you can bring them here once you're granted asylum. That's number one, what you need to know, um, by filing a petition once you get asylum. The problem uh, with that is, though, if, um, you know, your asylum case is going to take many years, it's going to take long. If you have affirmative asylum case, you know, that's going to take several years until they schedule your interview. Uh, but what you can do is you can file for expedite request. You can prepare information that your family is there, they're stuck, you're separated, your son and your wife is there, and that you that you want to bring them into the United States. Uh, but obviously your asylum case is still pending and that's going to take forever so they can expedite your case. You would do it by sending an email with a proof of document proof with the evidentiary proof to the asylum office that has your case. Now, if you have your case in immigration court, then you can request the immigration court by filing a motion to advance. If you have an immigration lawyer who's handling your asylum case, 
they need to be able to help you. If you don't have one, it's very important you get a lawyer for your asylum case, whether you have affirmative asylum or immigration court case. It's not that easy, and you have much higher chance of approval statistically if you have a lawyer representing you. That's a significant step. I mean, obviously, you're separated from your family, so that affects your entire family. So um, get a lawyer. I'll, I'll, I will be happy to help you. You can click the links um, in the contact section. On the, you know, There's a post on the chat section and you can schedule an appointment with me so we can discuss your case. But again, I recommend to expedite your case. Okay, anybody who joined recently, please thank you so much. Please post your questions in the chat section. Uh, even if you don't have a question, you have a comment, please feel free to post it in the chat section. I'll do my best to answer all of the questions today. Okay, so uh, Emir is asking, if entering uh, the US via CBP-1, will I get my work permit and SSN in 30 days? Or do I have to wait 150 days? Now, there is no 150 days wait time for, for if you enter the CBP-1 to apply for work permit based on the being paroled. You can apply immediately. Um, but uh, you will have to pay the filing fees, and it's not guaranteed to be approved within 30 days. Now, what you're confusing here is the 30-day and 150 days. 30-day uh, processing and 150 days waiting time is uh, counts from the date you apply for asylum. So if you entered with CBP-1, the next step in your case is to file your asylum application as soon as possible. And once you file your asylum application, then you will get a receipt. That receipt will show the date when your asylum application was accepted by the USCIS or if you file it with the court, it will be registered with the court on the date that it's filed with the court, docketed in your court's file. So from that date, you have to wait 150 days before you can apply for a work permit based on your pending asylum. The benefit of that work permit is that it will be valid for two years, not one year, not less, for two years. The second benefit is that it will be processed within 30 days from the time of filing. They will approve it within 30 days. So if you file for work permit based on your pending asylum case, it will be approved within 30 days. That's that's what the administration, the, the government guarantees, the USAS guarantees. And finally, there is no filing fee. So as you know, there is a $410 filing fee if you file for work permit based on parole or any other basis. Most of the basis you have to pay these filing fees. If you're filing it initially for based on your asylum case, pending asylum case, which has been pending for 150 days or more, then you don't pay the filing fees. So my recommendation is to prepare and file your asylum application as, as soon as possible. Now with that, I don't want you to be filing your asylum application, just the application form to get the clock start running. Don't do that. You will hear uh, bad advice from individuals, people that don't know this and they'll tell you just file the application so the clock starts running. If you do that, that significantly weakens your case because there are a number of individuals that file for asylum without having real basis for it. They just file for asylum to get by because they know that it's going to take many years. They want to get by and have work permit. When you file a bare minimum asylum application without your detailed declaration, your detailed written statement, and without evidence and support, of your asylum application without country conditions reports. If you don't do those things and just file the application, you're significantly weakening your case, weakening your case because the judge or the officer may perceive it as, or the government attorney may perceive it as if you didn't have basis, you just filed the asylum application and then started making up uh, evidence and information in support thereof. Of course, there are exceptions. If you are running a deadline, you have to file your asylum application within one year of entry. And if your one, one year of entry says tomorrow, then obviously you have to do whatever you can to file. Now, if you want to know how to write a declaration, your written statement, what are the you know general guidelines on what to write, how to write it, the format, and so on, watch my previous, I believe, live session or the one before that on our YouTube channel uh, where I describe it in great details. And there are also videos posted where I describe in great details on how to write asylum declaration, 
how to write, make a written statement in support of your asylum case. And this refers to any case, not just asylum case. So watch that video and you will see. Now, as to evidence, what kind of evidence, what you need to gather, what country conditions reports. Again, you can go and watch the uh, my video on the evidence and country conditions. There, all I'm doing is I'm describing what we do, what are the steps we take, and what I generally recommend in every case. Now, Every case has its own specific facts and specific circumstances. So don't take it as a, a advice specific to your case. For your case, as I always recommend, consult with an experienced immigration lawyer. And I will be one happy to help you. You can contact me. There is contact information below and in the chat section. Contact us. Let's schedule a consultation. Let's talk about your case and tell you what we can do, what's the best way you know, to file your asylum application and 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 to prepare uh, even before you enter the United States. Okay, HSN is asking, can the spouse of a green card holder entering with CBP-1 adjust status from asylum or can I can stay if asylum gets denied? No, so the spouse of a green card holder cannot adjust status in the U.S. after entering with CBP-1 or after entering through any other parole process. And the reason being is that if you have, if you're being sponsored as a spouse of a green card holder, you need to have a valid status before you can adjust it. Just as the name suggests, adjustment of status or a change of status requires you to have a status which you are adjusting to another status. If you don't have a status, you cannot adjust it to another status, right? So an exception to that is if you apply for asylum without status or if you're adjusting, adjusting your status based on marriage with a U.S. citizen. The fact that you don't have a status does not matter. So if you are married to the permanent resident who's sponsoring you and you entered with CBP-1, you cannot adjust your status in the U.S. Your, your two options are either to close your case, leave the U.S., go through U.S. consulate after the petition is approved and the consular schedules, interview, and so on. But watch out for any unlawful presence bars. If you spend here for more than more than six months without authorization, meaning expiration of your parole, uh, then you may incur uh, unlawful presence. So you may have to, then you will have to close your case by filing a voluntary departure request or getting a dismissal by the uh, through prosecutorial discretion. Then you can go to U.S. consulate abroad um, if your case is in immigration court. Um, and then your second option is to wait until your spouse becomes a U.S. citizen. So obviously, if they're a green card holder, eventually they will become a U.S. citizen. And once they do, then you can adjust your status in the U.S. because you entered through CBP process, CBP-1. That makes a legal end. That, that is legal entry. Now, if you entered illegally, if you crossed the border without CBP-1, or without coming to the border checkpoint and voluntarily asking them, telling them that I don't have a visa, I want to ask for asylum. If you don't do those things, if you just cross the border and then surrender, then you entered without inspection and you're not eligible for uh, adjustment of status in the US unless through asylum or you know some other special exceptional circumstances like a, Victim of crime, U visa, or a Violence Against Women Act, uh, green card through that process. Okay, so the next question is from um, Terry is asking. You mentioned the letter will help for the interview once it's scheduled. Should I email her a letter stating that I will be sponsoring her, include my tax return and proof that I own my house and cars? Uh, look, again, I cannot give you your case-specific advice. I'm giving general advice is that anytime one sponsors uh, a, a, a non-citizen who's trying to enter the United States through CBP-1 um, process, it's a good idea to write a written statement to provide tax returns, proof of ownership, proof of residence, and so on, right? So, But if you want a case-specific, again, consult with the attorney one-on-one, -on -one, uh, it doesn't have to be in person. It can be online over the phone, but do so so that, you know, you have specific regarding your case. Well, I can tell you is generally that's what is required. They're not required, but it's advisable. That's better. That makes it stronger, uh, less likely to be questioned. 
All right, Salah is asking, hello, sir. I am currently on B1, B2 visa. I would like to do an adjustment of status to F1 and apply for an asylum at the same. Is that possible? No, it's not possible, uh, the Salah. The problem is if you apply for a, if you apply for F1, you have to demonstrate that you have no immigrant intent. You have to affirmatively state and prove that you are going to stay, you, will, you are planning to stay here temporarily as a student and you have plans and residence back home and you're going to go back home. You're not planning to remain in the U.S. permanently. When you apply for asylum, you're pro proving the opposite of that. You need to demonstrate that you have fear of persecution. You cannot go back. You want to stay in the U.S. and you're asking for protection. You're asking for asylum, for ref refuge in the United States. So those two things contradict with each other. Now, that's not to say that an F1 student cannot maintain status and apply for asylum. You can. So if you are on F1 already and then you apply for asylum, you can still keep your F1. The, there is anecdotal, um, you know, not evidence, but um, rumors that somebody can lose their F1 status and so on. But in 16 years of my practice, I've never seen any F1 student status being terminated just because somebody applied for asylum. As long as you're still attending your classes, you're maintaining your F1 by paying tuition or whatever you, you, know, you need to do for your specific uh, educational program, then you can remain on F1. But no, you cannot apply for F1 and asylum at the same time. That's contradictory. Logically, it's not possible. You're lying. Basically, that would mean you're lying either on your asylum claim or you're lying on your F1 claim, which basically means you're misrepresenting information, you're not a credible person, and both of those applications will likely be denied. Okay, Ramiz is asking, what can you say about Biden's last decision for a legal crossing to U.S. from Mexico? Um, I don't know which last decision you're referring to. If you want to elaborate more what you mean about the last decision for a legal crossing to U.S. from Mexico, I will be happy to, uh, you know, discuss it and then tell you what I think about it. My fiance, Terry is asking, my fiance left Cuba with four other people. She originally filled out the paperwork with those people and understands that she has to stay with them in the USA, Florida, until all papers are mailed. No, the answer, Terry, it seems like you have lots of case-specific questions. Again, consult with a lawyer. But generally, to, to give the general answer about sponsorship and staying, no, once you enter the US, the, you, do not, you don't have to, with the CBP one, you do not have to live with the uh, sponsor. The sponsor is just there to guarantee that this person is not going to be homeless, is not going to be, you know, requiring public assistance, federal taxpayer money. So if that person, if the applicant comes in and they can live somewhere, they can make, they they, they can work, they they find a place to stay, or they have other relative or friend or somebody supporting them good for them. They don't have to be hanging on the neck of the sponsor. So that sponsorship, again, it does not require. You're free to move in the United States, wherever you want, um, as long as, you know, you notify the ICE since you entered, you, you, you have to notify the Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Or if your case is already in Immigration Court, you have to notify the Immigration Court of the change of your address. But you're free to move inside the U.S. wherever you find it better for you. Okay, and uh, HSN is asking, does it matter entering with CBP-1 from Texas or California? Do we have a risk facing racism in Texas port entry? Um, I don't think you have a risk of facing, facing racism in Texas just because it's Texas. But no, traditionally, yes, Texas uh, officers at, at Texas uh, border, CBP officers have been more, so to say, no, I wouldn't say anti-immigrant, less sympathetic, I would say, uh, to make it softer. So, for example, during uh, the Title 42, when the border officers could turn around asylum applicants, even asylum applicants during the pandemic, COVID-19, and the Biden, not the Biden, the, the Trump administration was adamant about enforcing it. They came up with this Title 42 enforcement because as we all know, they have been, uh, you know, anti-immigrant positioned, and that's how Trump 
was running and is, is running for president. So they tried to use the pandemic as a pretext to turn around the asylum applicants to basically hurt the inflow of the immigrants into the United States. Uh, in, and during that time, the border officers in Texas were uh, basically turning everybody around and not letting anybody to enter, even if they were claiming that they would be tortured in the U.S. and so on. You know, they were not, I mean, not in the U.S., tortured in, you know, wherever they have to go back. Um, technically, they were not supposed to do so even under Title 42, but who cares? Nobody would question those CBP officers, uh, you know, uh, actions, and they were significantly, they were basically anti-immigrant um, uh, officers, and they would turn everybody off, 100%. I, I, have, I haven't seen anybody who entered the U.S. during the pandemic Title 42, even if they applied for asylum through Texas border. On the other hand, in California, through San Diego, the border there, they would enter through, uh, I think it's called Calexico, Imperial. Uh, so they would enter the U.S. Uh, consistently. They would be allowed. Even with Title 42, the officers would make a decision that this person is not a threat, and they would still allow them to enter. So, yes, in that respect, uh, technically, yes, the, the border processing in California is easier um, better chances than in Texas. All right, T uh, is asking, hi, sir, my case is on the court and the final hearing date was the first week of July this year, but now it has changed to no date. How long will it take me to get another day in the future? Sir, uh, if you have a case in court and you're asking this question in public forum, you don't have a lawyer. I mean, if you have a lawyer, that lawyer is not doing their job because they are not answering these questions for you. I'm not trying to avoid answering your questions. I will, but I, I, I want you to be able to reunite with your family. Okay? It seems like you need a lawyer. Don't hire me. I'm not trying to, in this specific instance, I'm not trying to sell my services, right? Generally, I do these as part of marketing. I love, enjoy sharing, you know, answering questions, sharing my knowledge and so on. But we also do it as part of arms, so nothing to hide that, you know, we're marketing. But in your specific case, I'm not, you know, don't hire me. Get a lawyer, right? Because you, you're asking questions which are very case-specific and, and you know, don't rely on what I say here in general terms, right? So if you want to, you just get a quick answer and then you rely on it and it may not be applicable in your specific case. But as I said, your lawyer can communicate with the clerk to set the hearing date, especially you had it this July, you were supposed to have it this July, and it was canceled. There are many reasons it can be canceled. The judge felt sick, it was, you know, calendar uh, conflict and so on, but you had your case and you, you lost that hearing date, be, not because of your fault, but because something went wrong in the court. So that's another reason why they should expedite and schedule immediately. And, and your lawyer should file a motion to expedite your case, do it as soon as possible so that you can reunite your family and hopefully you win your case. Now, filing a motion to expedite without you having your entire case ready, meaning you have to have all of your evidence, your declaration, expert testimony, if your case requires an expert, most of the cases in immigration court do, it's strongly advisable, and you want to have your complete written statement, witness list, declarations from witnesses, you want to provide all of that to the court so that they know you're ready to proceed forward before you file or together with your expedite request, right? And to do this, again, you know, I, I don't want you to be a Unless you're an architect or an engineer who builds houses, I don't want you to build a house which is going to collapse on your head and cause serious damage. Same way here. Unless you have uh, you know, exceptional legal skills that you want to do it on your own, I don't want you to fail. So find the lawyer and, and let them help you with this case. All right. Terry is writing. Thank you so much for your kindness and answers. Terry, thank you for your questions and good luck with your uh, fiancé. Uh, Amir is asking, can I start a web design business via an LLC without a work permit while my asylum is pending? Yes, anyone can start an LLC or any kind of business in the U.S. You don't even have to be in the U.S. Anywhere you're in the world, I can register and create a company for you. Uh, and you don't have to 
have any kind of status in the U.S. to own a business in the U.S. Now, to work for your business, that's another issue. They need to have a work authorization to work for your business. Or you can hire uh, individuals who have work permit or citizenship or green card to do the work for your business. But to own a business, anyone can do it. Student, visitor, undocumented, asylum applicant, no matter what. All right. Anybody who joined us uh, now, thank you so much for joining. My name is Ismail Shakhtakhtinsk. I'm the principal immigration attorney at IS Law Firm. I'm a member of American Immigration Lawyers Association. This is our weekly live stream. If you like this live stream, please uh, press like. I greatly appreciate that. Please also subscribe to our channel or join our Facebook page so you are notified about our live streams. We have weekly live streams every Thursday at 12.30 p.m. So every Thursday, 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which is Washington, D.C. and New York time. So uh, this is our live stream. Today is uh, August 24, 2023. Uh, please post your questions in the chat section. In the beginning of the video I, of the live stream, I spoke about the current condition of border processing at the southern border, CBP-1 app. Unfortunately, things are delayed it takes significantly more time than it used to. So if you are planning to come to the U.S. or if you have somebody who's coming to U.S. through Mexico, um, make sure that they're prepared to wait in Mexico for maybe a couple months or more. The most I have heard was about two months, about eight weeks or so. Uh, but you know, many report about five weeks of wait time, six weeks of wait time, and sometimes it's shorter. So if you like this video, please uh, press like, please subscribe to our channel uh, and our Facebook page, and please post your questions in the chat section so I can answer those questions. Okay, Neo is asking, making an appointment for asylum through CBP-1 can take a long time. During this time, our Mexico visa will expire. We will be in Mexico illegally. In this case, where do we enter the U.S. from Mexico? Well, the U.S. doesn't care what's your status in Mexico. So whether you will be illegally or legally in Mexico, it doesn't change where you enter the U.S. from Mexico. Now, if you apply for us, if you're coming to apply for asylum, it doesn't matter how you enter the U.S. if you have basis for asylum. But if you enter through without inspection, you know, or without CBP-1 app, you will have a presumption of... Uh, uh, ineligibility based on the third country tra ban, transit ban, which means if you cross through another country, including Mexico, you will have to demonstrate why you didn't apply for asylum there, why it wasn't safe for you. So um, bottom line is there is no difference, uh, you know, whether what your status is in Mexico or how you entered Mexico. Uh, all the United States cares about is that you're coming to the U.S. through the CBP-1 app, and do not cross the border illegally. Do not use smugglers. Again, you will have a transit ban and that will create significant issue for your case. All right, continuing with the questions from our social media. If anybody has any questions, please post them in the chat section. I will do my best to answer everyone. All right, from social media, um, Bill is asking, I'm a green card holder. Can I stay in the US for three months and then stay outside for the US? outside the U.S. for three months? The answer is, based on what you wrote, three months here, three months there, yes, you can do so as long as you still consider the United States as your residence and you travel uh, to other places temporarily. But watch our video about maintaining your status here, about the reentry permit. It's on our channel. If you go into the videos and you look at our channel, or it's also on our Facebook videos, Facebook page, where I do describe your responsibilities as a permanent resident, how much time you have to spend in the U.S., and what if you have to spend continuous or frequent uh, time outside of the U.S., uh, if you need to frequently travel outside of the U.S., what you need to do or what you can do to make sure you don't lose your green card, your permanent residence in the U.S., you don't end up in trouble when returning to the U.S., and, and that is you can apply for a re-entry permit. Again, uh, Instead of reinventing the wheel, go to our videos uh, on our channel and, and find that video and watch it. It will, it will tell you everything you need to know about that. Okay. Um, next, Marie is asking, 
Can you help with Biden parole for people that are in Haiti? Yes, I can help uh, with people everywhere. It doesn't matter whether they're in Haiti or not. Um, and yes, there is a parole program for Haitians. Um, T is writing, thank you, sir, for your advice. Thank you, Tia, for questions and good luck with your case. HSN, as an approved asylee, what if I apply asylum in Europe and get denied? Can I return back to U.S.? Uh, if you maintain your asylum status, well, I mean, first of all, why would you apply for asylum in Europe if you have asylum in the U.S.? If you, if you leave the U.S., uh, with the purpose of applying for asylum in Europe, the United States may withdraw, may basically terminate your asylum application. I mean, asylum uh, status. Um, if you uh, stayed, and be careful, if you travel outside of the U.S., even with asylum and travel document, and you have previously spent more than six months inside the U.S. without authorization, meaning without status and without any pending case, then you may have a three-year ban, or if you spend more than 12 months, then you may have a 10-year ban. So until you get a green card, don't travel. Now, if you get a green card, you have a permanent residency of U.S., and you get a travel document as an asylee, and you travel to, to Europe, and you apply for asylum there, you will have to prove there that you you know, you, you, you will be persecuted in the United States. The bottom line is, you know, I'm not a law, an, an immigration lawyer in Europe. I'm a U.S. United States immigration lawyer. So I can tell you in the United States, if you had asylum from Europe and you applied for asylum here, you would be automatically denied because you already have asylum. There is no reason for the United States. I suspect the countries in Europe have the similar law because most of these laws are coming from... Uh, the United Nations Convention on the Status of Refugees, which is the basis for asylum claims. So, you know, that's that's the challenge you're going to have. Okay, the next question from the uh, social media is, uh, hello, mister, I'm in USA with CBP-1 program. How many days does it take to get work permit and social security number? Uh, it depends. If you apply through CBP-1 program, you know, we see sometimes cases taking several weeks, sometimes several months. Now, one thing you need to do is once you are already in the United States, you need to apply for asylum as soon as possible. And once you do, your clock begins. And after 150 days, you can file for a work permit and you're guaranteed to get it approved within 30 days. And there is no filing fee for a work permit based on your pending asylum. And that work permit is going to be valid for two years. So that's why... You know, unless you want to do both, you can file for based on the CBP-1, based on parole, but you will have to pay the filing fees of $410, and then you can try this through based on as pending asylum. We strongly recommend to file asylum as soon as possible once you enter with the CBP-1 app process. All right, uh, next question is, many people reported that it took several months to receive these documents. Can you tell me how to get it quickly? Now, I mean, if you have basis for expediting, you can do the expedite request. You can watch, uh, I believe it was a couple sessions before, live uh, streams before, where I uh, described the expedite process and what can uh, happen and, and so on, uh, how to do it. So you can place an expedite request. Okay, HSN uh, writes, I want to abandon my asylum status if I find it safe in another country. I don't feel safe and welcomed here. I understand and I'm very sorry that you feel that way. You know, America, United States being my home, um, I, I, I feel sad that you don't feel welcome here in the United States. Um, as I said, it's going to be challenged to prove that you, you're not going to Europe because, you know, you just find it better there, better life there. Even if you abandon your asylum status here, you will have to most likely. Again, I'm not a European asylum lawyer, so talk to the law to a lawyer in Europe, in the country that you're going to about all these issues. Tell them you have asylum in the United States, you want to abandon and go there uh, to that other country and see if that country's asylum laws will allow you to do so, or will you be automatically denied asylum? So talk to them. They may be able to help you. Um, um, Bio Dundari is asking, when will you discuss I-Visa? 
Well, IV is, is for journalists, uh, media individuals working for international media or journalists who are coming to the United States for a special project. There is not that many, you know, audience members, people who uh, are, you know, uh, subscribed to our channel, who are media or journalists or members of foreign media. That's why I don't think we're going to have a separate session on iVisa. But if you do want to consult, you can get in touch with us. You can go online and schedule a consultation online with me or with any other qualified lawyer who worked with foreign media and on iVisa. So and I worked on those quite a bit. The next question is from Rajvi Singh. Hello, sir. I wanted to ask that can we apply for asylum in USA after completing our master's in USA? Yes, of course, you can. Now, if you completed your master's in USA, that means you were on F1 student visa, I assume, or maybe J1. It doesn't matter. So once you complete your program, whether it's F1 or J1, then you are you have a grace period of 30 days with J1, 60 days with F1, as long as you completed your program. Or you may have OPT, optional practical training, if you were on F1. So, but if you don't exercise your optional practical training and you lost your status F1, then you have very limited amount of time to apply for asylum. My generally recommendation is to file for asylum as soon as possible, as soon as you know that you qualify for asylum or that you are asking for asylum, that you're afraid to go back. Because the longer you wait, the more chances you will be questioned, why didn't you apply on time? Now, as you all know, you have to apply for asylum within one year of entry into the U.S. There are exceptions to it. And one of those exceptions is having a valid status, which you maintain. So as you wrote here, Raj Virsingh, Singh, if, if uh, you had a fund status, but it's about to expire because you're now done with your study program, you, you have roughly six months. The, the sooner, the better. There is no specific... Uh, timeline of six months, but it's based on the one of the precedents of the court decisions, Board of Immigration Appeals, uh, in stated that, you know, roughly within six months is okay to apply as soon as you lose status. Next question. Let's say I think audience members posted a question. All right. Um, Marie is writing, can you expedite my brother case? He's in danger and I don't know what else to do. It depends. I mean, I cannot tell you, yes, I can expedite the specific case because I don't know anything about the specifics of your brother's case. But yes, we do expedite cases. We do that frequently. That's part of the services we provide. So if you, you or your brother want to schedule a consultation with me, the links are there in the chat section on the top. It will be posted at the bottom as well. And uh, in the description of the video, I'll be happy to consult and tell you what I can do to help. All right. A boss is asking, hello, thanks for the job. Thank you for joining a boss. Uh, I just want to enter the border without CBP-1, but I have been inspected. And they gave me meeting. Uh, they gave me for meeting and it will be 11 October. So do I have to take a lawyer before? La a lawyer before? Uh, well, nobody has to have a lawyer. It's advisable. The sooner the better. So that when you have this meeting, if you're asked about your case, you don't want to make statements which will be used against you down the road. You know, you've seen it in the movies and so on, right? What you say is going to be used against you in court. So similarly here, if they, at the border they ask you questions about the basis for your asylum claim and you're not prepared, then you tell them something that may sound you know, inconsistent down the road when you do apply, enter the U.S. and apply for asylum, then they will find those, the government attorney in immigration court, and will use it against you and tell the judge that, look, they told this, that at the border, now they're saying this. So make sure you're well prepared ahead of time, and it's also advisable to have documents, some kind of proof documents, because you never know <clears throat> when you will be questioned and what you will be questioned about. All right, Salah wrote, uh, thank you, sir, for the answer. In case if I manage to do adjustment form four from B1, B2 visa to F1 later during the year, is it possible to apply for asylum? Is my asylum application going to be credible? Look, Salah, it, it's not black or, and white, you know. Uh, 
it depends. There is a individual uh, officer, you know, since you're going to be applying affirmatively, your, your case is going to be considered by the officer. And since you're asking this question, something tells you that maybe if you apply for F1 with the plans of down the road applying for asylum, you are probably misrepresenting information. So the same office, the same logic can apply when the officer is reviewing your case. So there is no lawyer. This is not a legal question. It's just a human factor. There is a person sitting there. If the officer is doing their job diligently, they should ask you this question and say, how come you applied for F1 and immediately after you applied for asylum? Did you know at the time you applied for F1 that you were going to apply for asylum? Uh, they can ask you this question. And based on your answer, the officer can decide, are you telling the truth or are you lying? Maybe you're giving the wrong answer now. So you're misrepresenting. All of that can damage your credibility. But I cannot tell you one way or another. You know, just think about it logically that there is a human being on the other end who's going to be uh, considering these facts and making the decision based on what you, you know, based on your answers. Okay. Um, the next question I have is, uh, sir, uh, so Chavez Williams is asking, sir, my wife and our family have filed our I-589 in February 2022, and there has been no update on the interview till now. Could you please inform me how long it is it taking for the interview in our case? Also, we filed asylum two years after we entered into USA. Would that be a cause concern for denial in that case? Yes, unfortunately, the, the filing two years after entry is a significant concern and it could be cause for denial. There are, as I said, certain exceptions, change in uh, country conditions, change in circumstances, or if you had extraordinary you know, uh, reasons why you couldn't apply during the first two years. So all of that is the, you know, the questions that are case specific that you need to consult with a lawyer about. Um, now, uh, in terms of how long it takes, currently asylum interviews are very chaotic. Most of them are scheduled within four, five, six, seven years after the <clears throat> filing date. Uh, they do frequently, though, schedule uh, applications that have been delayed, that have been filed more than one year because they assume that they're going to quickly deny it and move, uh, remove your case from their uh, you know, workload. So... You may be scheduled faster, uh, but considering you filed it two years late, uh, you know, you're risking, I mean, if they don't approve your case, they'll send it to immigration court and you will be one step from order of removal. So I don't know why you're excited about uh, getting interviewed so quickly, considering that you have this serious issue of one year deadline. Okay. Um, on CBP-1 app, can we choose the port of entry we want to apply for? I believe so. Again, I, I'm not certain about this. I probably should one time go through basically the entire app. But um, as I understand, again, it's, it has to be done in Mexico. Maybe I'll go to Mexico and go through the border. Actually, I have this plan, maybe taking a trip uh, to Mexico and then um, going through the border, kind of like accompanying someone uh, who's using the CBP-1 app to see what is going on. Just never got to it, but I should probably do that. All right, so uh, I will answer one more question from social media, and we will wrap it up. Anyone who joined us uh, recently, thank you so much. This is our weekly live stream every week at every Thursday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have this live session where I talk about immigration topics. Today's topic was Southern Border Processing, uh, CBP-1, the current state of the border processing in U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, and then I answer the questions from our audience members. If you like this format, please press like, please subscribe to our channel. And please send us your friends and relatives and acquaintances who may be having immigration questions. Tell them that this uh, Ismail Shakhtarczynski, this immigration attorney in the United States, is answering questions free of charge online on these live sessions every Thursday at 12.30 p.m. Okay, so the question from 
Uh, admin, I will ask, answer Mohamed Pray saying, Dear sir, please, uh, we need a video of update at the border and tutorial on how to apply when you get to the southern border by using the CBP1 app. Thank you. Uh, that's a good idea. As I said, I mean, that's, you know, I didn't read this question even before I said that I have this plan to go take a trip to Mexico and then accompany someone or meet, you know, with, with applicants there in Mexico and then help with CBP1 app and maybe enter the United States with them to kind of go through the process together with them. Maybe we can make a, a grandiose video uh, report about this whole trip. I, I do probably need to find some journalist, some videographer to do this. That might be a, that might be a good idea. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone joining. Uh, I am wrapping this up. Uh, the, please press like, please subscribe to our channel. And if you have any questions after this video is posted on our uh, YouTube channel, you can post your questions in the comment section and I will do my best to answer. Please join us next week at 1230 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, New York time for the next live session. Oh, I and I believe I had the topic already for the next week. Um, I think it was mandamus action, how to expedite your asylum interview through filing case in immigration court. So that's what I wanted to discuss next week, next Thursday. As we all know, most of the asylum interviews are stuck for many years. So there is a way to expedite it. And we're going to talk about that next Thursday at 12.30 p.m. Thank you very much and have a nice rest of the week. Bye-bye.